and kick off the show in just a minute. Uh, who's excited? Woo! Alrighty, I'm gonna go ahead and let uh, Mr. Barker do his thing. All right, thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, so, good evening and, and welcome. Uh, I'm David Barker. I'm the director of the Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies here at AU, uh, where we aim to strengthen the democratic square through research programs and events. Uh, it's my distinct privilege tonight to welcome you to our latest Thurber Dialogue on Democracy. The Thurber Dialogues are conversations with prominent thought leaders about how to strengthen democracy in the United States and abroad. They began in the spring of 2021, thanks to a generous gift from Distinguished University Emeritus Professor Jim Thurber uh, and his wife, Claudia Thurber. And over the past two years, we've benefited from hosting dialogues with elected officials such as Senator Cory Booker, uh, representatives uh, James Clyburn uh, and Hakeem Jeffries, as well as prominent thought leaders such as Ann Applebaum and Robert Putnam and others. Tonight, uh, we're very grateful for our, our friends uh, and co-sponsors at Kennedy Political Union to, um, to be talking to Jonah Goldberg. Mr. Goldberg is the ASNIS Chair in Applied Liberty at the American Enterprise Institute and a fellow at the National Review Institute. He has been a weekly columnist for the Los Angeles Times since 2005 and a nationally syndicated columnist since 2000. He also hosts the popular podcast, The Remnant, with Jonah Goldberg. His syndicated column appears regularly in the Chicago Tribune, New York Post, Dallas Morning News, and scores of other papers, and he is the author of multiple best-selling books. His most recent book, which we'll talk about tonight, is Suicide of the West, How the Rebirth of Tribalism, Populism, Nationalism, and Identity Politics is Destroying American Democracy. Was he poking his head out a second ago? Or is that the deal? All right, come on in. All right, Mr. Goldberg. <laughs> yeah, that will work. Um, and Jonah is going to be uh, interrogated uh, tonight. Uh, maybe not interrogated. Uh, questioned tonight by Ron Elving, uh, an executive in residence and prof professorial lecturer in the School of Public Affairs here at American University, and a senior correspondent, of course, contributing to NPR News, where he became the senior Washington editor uh, back in the 1990s, or as he likes to say, in an earlier century. Uh, Ron came to Washington as a Congressional Fellow with the American Political Science Association in 1984, and he worked for members of the House and the Senate before joining Congressional Quarterly, or CQ, where he was political editor. He is the author of Conflict and Compromise, How Congress Makes the Law, and has contributed chapters to several collections of academic work on Congress and the presidency. Okay, so the way this is going to work up, come on in. Come on in. All right, so I'm going to shut up now. The way this is going to work uh, is that Ron and Jonah are going to chat for about 30 or 40 minutes, uh, and then all of you will get a chance to, to get into the act uh, for another 20 or 30 minutes after that. Uh, and again, just to remind you, after this is over, uh, we have a nice reception with uh, refreshments hard and soft uh, waiting outside. So take it away, guys. a little bit unlike what you'll hear, but most of your conversations and most of your classes are going to be, and we'll touch on some of the familiar and some of the unfamiliar. Uh, one of the things that I've respected most about John, Jonah's work over the years uh, has been the way that he manages to distill a great deal of what I would have to call early wisdom <laughs> into something that comes across as an editorial in the language that an online writer so that it is access, if you will, to the intellectual products of Western civilization, but expressed in such a way that you could imagine seeing somebody in Western Green just speaking in a normal voice. That is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. It's something that very few journalists or academics have ever managed to bring up. So I'd like to try to capture a little bit of that, and I'm sure you will capture a little bit of that, and, and I'm sure the folks at Grand Corner. Uh, let me just start. Experiencing a, a particular kind of weather, <laughs> a kind of, a, it, I would call it a cool day, maybe a high overcast with a subtle sprinkle of breeze, but I'm still so 
in the air, but a great deal of play, a sense of high visibility. So that's how I came about this, and I want to start with some of the concepts around human nature, because that's really where the big play comes from, the concept of being human. We say that tyranny works, and that tyranny is natural. We say that democracy is not natural. Capitalism is not natural. And a great number of other things that we're doing, such as the prison system, are not natural. Talk a little bit about human nature. Sure. Um, first of all, do I really need this microphone? Um, uh, so first of all, uh, I'm a sucker for meteorological metaphors, so thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, um, you know what? I was wondering about that. So uh, where to begin? Yeah. So look. Uh, I think democracy is unnatural. I think capitalism is un unnatural. I think um, uh, the rule of law, to a certain extent, that's a little more complicated, is unnatural. But I, that does not mean I think that these are bad things. In philosophy, we call it the naturalistic fallacy of thinking that just because something occurs in nature, um, that it's good. And if something doesn't occur in nature, it's bad. Um, and the simple fact is, is that you know, liver transplants are unnatural. Penicillin is unnatural. There are lots of things that, you know, electricity and Wi-Fi are unnatural. There are all sorts of good things that are unnatural. Um, and so part of my argument is that uh, really has to do with the concept of corruption. Now, when we talk about corruption today, we generally think about graft and bribes and, you know, whatever a, a given governor of, Chicago, of Illinois does on a daily basis. Um, but if you actually read... Shakespeare, read the Bible. Corruption actually means something different. It means rot. It means decay. It means entropy. It's the second law of thermodynamics. It's this idea that nature will reclaim everything, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And um, if you know anything about, say, uh, if, you, if you know anyone who's ever owned a boat, you know that they actually have to work, you have to keep it, you have to maintain it, or nature's just going to take it back. It doesn't matter if it's an outhouse or a grandfather clock, if you leave it in the woods and you don't take care of it, the termites and the elements are going to take it back. Nature takes everything. As the Roman poet, um, I think it was Herodotus, said, um, you can chase nature out with a pitchfork. It'll always come rushing back in. And I think that that's true about the external physical world. I also think it's true about human beings, that most of the forms of corruption that uh, really bedevil democracies, that bedevil society, have to do with human nature running amok. Um, my dad always used to say that the single most corrupting thing in his professional life was friendship, not money. And the example that he always used is you say, look, say a complete stranger called me and said, I'll give you $5,000 if you give my kid an internship. My dad would say, get the hell out of here. But what if his oldest friend from college or high school called and said, hey, look, my son's having a really hard time or my daughter's having a really hard time and it would really turn their life around if you just help them out and give them this internship? My dad said, I might still say no, but it would be a much harder decision. And so most of the things that we as Westerners think are corrupt about corrupt governments are actually natural forms of human organization. When, it, when international aid groups look at places like Afghanistan and they say, you know, you need to have open contracts and the rule of law and, and honest dealings and all these kinds of things. The Afghans rightly say, look, this is the way we've done business for thousands of years. There's never been a society in all of human history where people haven't done special favors for their friends and their relatives. That's human nature. And part of this whole, uh, the whole idea of modernity and human progress is coming up with systems and rules that allow us to deal with the corrupting power of human nature and tell us how to behave even though in our guts, in our, in our hearts, we want to go a different way. And I think one of the things that's really causing havoc in our society is that we teach people from a very young age to go with their instincts, go with their guts, right? Be true to yourself. You know, we tell little kids, you know, like, it is by nature, it is, it is a fact of logic that being a good parent means being a bit of a hypocrite and saying, do as I say, not as I do. 
And being a good parent means not telling kids, just go with your instincts. You know, no good parent says, hey, you know, personally, I wouldn't run with scissors. But you have to be true to yourself. So you just, you know, you spread, you run with those scissors, you go where you want, right? Or, hey, look, you know, look, I, I, I'm an old fuddy-duddy. You have to be authentic and listen to your true self. So you go ahead and you taste those lead paint chips. Um, the, isn't, the essence of civilization is teaching people how to harness human nature in positive ways and to resist the temptations uh, of negative human nature that um, defined human organizations for 250,000 years. And you don't fail to use the example that I think came to a lot of people's minds uh, when you started talking about this, which was William Golding's Lord of the Flies, right. and, and the idea that if you took English schoolboys who I think you described as the apogee of civilization, I mean, they've had every advantage, they've had fabulous educations, and you would think that they would have inculcated the values of English society at its height, and, and yet reduced to a primitive situation on a remote island, they become, well, how would you describe them? Quite barbaric? Tribal, right? Because human beings are naturally tribal. I love apocalyptic science fiction, zombie movies, zombie TV shows, all that kind of stuff, um, uh, Road Warrior, all that. And all of this genre, when the second the thin veer, veneer of civilization goes away, what do people do? They revert back into small bands of tribal people um, protecting kith and kin against everybody else. That is the natural form of human organization going back hundreds of thousands of years. And the part of the reason, I don't want to jump ahead of Ron's questions, but part of the reason I wrote the book is that the way I did is that um, I kind of believe that I should model the kind of behavior that was lacking on so much of the right, which was I was trying to persuade people who disagreed with me. And so one of the key points, the first sentence of the book says, there is no God in this book. I'm not trying to make an argument that liberal democratic capitalism is awesome because God says so, or the Constitution is awesome because God says so, because that's only persuasive to people who already agree on the authority. I try to argue from the perspective of your typical well-intentioned progressive who thinks politics and government are supposed to do certain things to improve people's lives. And my argument is that liberal democratic capitalism did more to fight poverty and pull people, humanity, out of the muck of poverty, which is the natural condition of humanity, into prosperity than any other system. And for 250,000 years, the average human being everywhere in the world made no more than $3 a day. Ancient Rome, ancient China, ancient Greece, doesn't matter. South America, North America, Africa. Um, every now and then it might blip up a little bit, and then you would have the Malthusian logic of regression to the mean, and people would be poor again. And only once in all of human history did that change, and it changed because of uh, this weird new insight that said, um, let's not do things the way people have always done it. Let's not give in to sort of what we think is the natural organization of society. Let's respect the individual. Let's believe that you know, we are citizens, not subjects, and that our rights come from God and not from government. So and that, that idea which you associate with John Locke, and uh, we're soon going to meet his, uh, if you will, his, his opponent in the great discussion here, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. But before we get to that, uh, you do point out how little progress was made for how very long and then how much progress has been made in a few centuries, really, just a handful of centuries. And you use the phrase, and I want to make sure we all are understanding these terms the same way, the term you use is liberal democratic capitalism. Mm -hmm. And we all have certain associations with each of those words, right? We know what a liberal is as opposed to, some, as opposed to something else. Democratic, obviously, is associated with one of our political parties. But as you point out elsewhere in the book, uh, there are many countries around the world that use that word in the name of their country, including North Korea. Sure. So democratic is a, a term worth chewing over a little bit. And then finally, capitalism as well, which is just as essential to that progress that you're talking about in, in your formulation as the liberal democracy mm -hmm. element of it. Now, are you comfortable with all those? I know that those are the classic terms when we talk about classic liberalism. Uh, those, are the, those are the words that we use for describing this intellectual movement in a particular part of the world. Uh, are you still comfortable using all those words, or do you feel that they've all taken on so much freight that it's hard to talk about liberal democratic capitalism? Well, I mean, there's a 
I'll back up for a second. There's a reason why I also talk about this moment where the hockey stick graph starts to go like this as the mirror. Uh, there's nobody in the realm of sort of anthropology, economics, and all that who disputes, broadly speaking, my, our, my contention that for 250,000 years since Homo sapiens effectively split off from the Neanderthals, um, uh, that the average human being lived on about $3 a day. Some people say it's $6 a day. Some people say it's $2 a day. But this basic flat line of, of abject poverty being the natural condition for most of humanity, left-wing economists, Marxists, right-wing economists, they all basically agree on that directionally. They might argue about methodology or where you put the line. The, our, the question of where and why it changed, hugely controversial, right? You have people on the left saying it was slavery. You have people on the left saying it was um, you know, you know, the role of cotton, which is another way of saying the role of slavery, or colonialism, or imperialism, or mercantilism. You have people on the right saying all sorts of things. Um, uh, there's huge contention about why it happened. But everybody agrees that it happened. And part of the reason why I call it the miracle is I don't care to a certain extent. I mean, I disagree that it was about slavery. I disagree it was about colonialism, though those things were important and have moral significance beyond you know, those other things. But when you have something wonderful and good that literally lifts, hum lifts humanity out of poverty, allows people um, to live longer lives, better lives, healthier lives, more productive lives, um, uh, for the first time in, in human history, and you don't know why, where it came from, calling it a miracle sort of gets at it, because a miracle is this sort of beneficial, unexplainable phenomenon. Now, the Locke part, liberal democratic capitalism, I'm fine with coming up with other terminology. I mean, like you could have said Adam Smith, because mm -hmm. Locke is just a stand-in. I have lots of disagreements with Locke. But this basic idea, I'm a big fan of Deirdre McCloskey. Um, and her basic argument is, is that what changed was really words. The story we told ourselves about ourselves, about what to value, changed in the late 1600s, early 1700s. Starting in England, some people say Holland. So if there are any Dutch jingoists out there, we can have that argument later. Um, and it was this basic re revolution in rhetoric that said, again, our rights come from God, not from government, that we are citizens, not subjects. The government works for us. We don't work for it. Um, that uh, we are endowed with inalienable rights that the government is there to protect rather than that the government is uh, there to grant. Um, and key to Deirdre's argument and my own is that innovation is good. For most of Western civilization and Eastern civilization and Southern civilization, anywhere where the powers that be felt threatened by inventions, by innovations, by technological advancement, they shut it down. Chinese had everything before Europe, you know, printing presses, ocean-going fleets, all that kind of stuff. The Koreans were better at making steel, but the second it created a sort of a bourgeois threat to the divine rulers, to the empire or the king or whatever, it got shut down. In the West, innovation was literally a sin. It was the sin of curiositas, the, the sin of questioning the established order. And then very suddenly, because of the scientific revolution or the enlightenment or someone had a plate of bad clams, I don't know, it's a miracle. All of a sudden, people said, no, 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 no. The fruits of your labor actually belong to you. That innovation is good. Building a better mousetrap is good. And the government organized to sort of protect that. And that's one of the things that really drives the exponential growth in, in human wealth and prosperity. I think that comes from things like the rule of law, which I think is essential to liberalism, right? This idea that, um, no one's above the law, no one's below the law, that you have inalienable rights, that you are entitled to certain due process, that property rights are going to be protected and not you know, uh, played games with by corrupt regimes. Um, democratic, it starts off not very sort of electorally democratic, but this idea that the, pop, that the people themselves have legitimacy and should have a say in how they're governed um, is, is a big part of it. And capitalism, I don't love the word capitalism, it was basically a creation of the Marxists that, you know, uh, it, like, market, mm -hmm. but you know, people know what I mean when I say capitalism, so capitalism. This is one of the perils, perhaps, of big history, which is really what you're talking about, because you're not really talking about individual people's lives very much. Right. Uh, you're talking about the large forces over many, many years. You're talking about tens of thousands of years, and then suddenly you're talking about just a few centuries. 
but that still seems like a lot of history. And you're talking about a lot of different cultures and societies, so you're multiplying out those numbers of years by many, many, many people and many societies. And yet it does fall together when you consider the changes that are measurable, the, the data changes, the, the, the income, if you will, the, the standards of living. And those do seem to go largely hand in glove with changes in what has to be called political political distribution of goods, right? I mean, that is the definition of politics that you use, is, sure. is that you know, econ economics is the production of goods, but politics is the distribution. And so we have this very different concept of what is right and that that takes hold Northwestern Europe and spreads right. and is at times up and down been spreading throughout the whole world. That's that's your that's your essential thesis. Am I am I am yeah? I, that's that's, my that's fair. I mean, I, I could gild the lily, but that that works. Yeah. All right, and then we start to get pushback. We start to get pushback in a number of different ways, and maybe we should just focus a little bit here on say the the American experience mm -hmm. of the pushback that has come to the miracle from various and sundry directions. Uh, over the course of the American history that we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, the various isms that you mentioned in your title or subtitle, uh, you, you talk about those as being in some sense or another pushback against the miracle. Mm -hmm. and, and why does that then occur? Doesn't everyone recognize that the miracle was beneficial and that it spread its benefits more broadly than anything before it? No, look, I mean, there's some pushback that's entirely justified. Um, certainly, uh, I, mean, I would have liked that we never had slavery. Um, I would have liked that even if we had slavery, the Civil War wouldn't have been necessary to end slavery. But given the history and the facts, I would rather that we had the Civil War than <laughs> maintain slavery. Similarly, I would have very much liked that the Civil Rights you know, uh, Revolution didn't take a century to play out. You know, so there are all sorts of things that um, this, that th this rising tide of prosperity does not that's the wrong metaphor because the, the whole idea of a rising tide is it lifts all boats, and it didn't, not in an equal proportion. And I believe passionately that we should talk about the negative aspects of American history and Western history um, for two reasons. One, and this is a point Barack Obama used to make very well, um, is that it lets you talk about the progress that we've made. If you can't talk about the mistakes that we've made, if you can't talk about the setbacks that we've had, if you can't talk about our sins, you can't talk about the process of improving upon the, 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 the society at large. Um, and those things, and so part of, and, and, but the other reason why I want to talk about that stuff is it's important not to judge, part of the problem that we have, particularly this is a left-wing problem, the right has lots of problems, don't get me wrong, um, but there is this tendency to judge the past by some ideal in the future. Um, and the way you should judge things that happened in the past, particularly in the American context, is with the things that came before it. So the remarkable thing about America, there are two things that are remarkable about American slavery. One is that a country that was founded on these, ideas, these propositions that all men are created equal would have slavery made it particularly hypocritical. And that's an important point that's worth talking about for a, in a second. But the other one is that we ended slavery because slavery was an institution that was all around the world for a very long time. It is a very old institution. Um, that is not to justify it, but it is to say that the things that America did in 1776 or 1789 or 1812 or 1865, these were massive improvements upon what came before. They were insufficient for where we want to go. But um, uh, let's talk about the hypocrisy for just two seconds. The hypocrisy of slavery is particularly poignant for America because there is nothing hypocritical about a monarchy having slavery. Um, there's something profoundly hypocritical, sinfully hypocritical about a, a, a liberal democracy having slavery. And the glory of what Abraham Lincoln did at Gettysburg that Martin Luther King picked up on in, uh, in his I Have a Dream speech in March on Washington was, you know, if you go back and you look at it, he says, look, the Founding Fathers issued a promissory note, and we've come here to collect. And what he was doing was, that before I said that rhetoric is the story we tell ourselves about ourselves, 
he was rhetorically saying to, I hate the phrase white America, but he was saying to white America, you are falling short of the best story you tell yourself about yourself. You say that this country was founded on these ideals and you've fallen short. And if it were not for that hypocrisy, I don't think that you would get the buy-in from the political system to say we're going to fix this problem. And hypocrisy tells it, it gnaws at you and tells you where you've gone wrong. And that's why you have to teach about this stuff. But this doesn't take away from the fact that, that you know, liberal democratic capitalism has done more to alleviate poverty, illiteracy, low life expectancy, all of these things that people say are hugely important. Um, and there is no alternative system that really can replace it. But it does war to some degree with human nature. And it does war also with that set of longings or yearnings that to some degree you associate with, with Rousseau mm -hmm. and what you call romanticism. And I think that that is another term which encountered in your book uh, has a tendency to sort of bring people up short, like the word miracle, which obviously has a lot of implications. Uh, when you then talk about the romanticism of various other isms, all these beliefs that we can somehow have an idealized set of relationships with each other that is in some sense or another less mercantile perhaps, less, less, less regimented in some respects, uh, warmer, if that's a good term, uh, something more emotionally satisfying, you talk about that as, as various forms of romanticism, and, and into that category many things fall. You want to talk about that a little bit and sure. maybe get, get to populism at the end of that? Sure. So romanticism, you know, sounds like it's, you know, either a description of her school of poetry and painting or, you know, the Hallmark movie of the week. But romanticism originally basically, it's it was a rebellion against the Enlightenment. It was a rebellion against the idea that you could reduce politics, never mind society, and human nature to these allegedly cold rules, mechanical rules of society. And, um, and it's worth pointing out that originally, the whole concept of nationalism, people used to call it romantic nationalism. It was like nationalism was romantic. It was this idea that your feelings come first, that your feelings are the most important thing, that passion comes first, um, and reason comes second, if at all. And you can see how nationalism would come out of, that, come out of it. The original nationalist movements in Germany were a rebellion against basically Napoleon-imposed French Enlightenment principles. And they said it, they felt it was unnatural, it was inauthentic. We Germans are this natural people who are connected to the land, yada, yada, yada. Um, and let me just sort of, rather than dwell on the intellectual history stuff, I'll, I'll cut to the chase, which is that um, I come from the point of view that communism, fascism, Nazism, socialism, these are all different forms of tribalism. They're not all morally equal, but they are all different forms of tribalism, as is populism, as is nationalism. Um, Nazism is tribalism for one race. Socialism is tribalism for one class. Um, or at least communism was tribalism for one class. Uh, fascism was tribalism for one, one country. Um, it is all, they're all different forms of saying that the group is more important than the individual that we get our meaning from being in big groups, that, um, that uh, the individual is not the proper political unit of society, the group is, the tribe is. And that is natural. That is what I'm getting at when I'm talking about human nature. That is how we are wired. There's this thing, sociologist um, Robin Dunbar called Dunbar's number. We are basically, our brains are wired to only know about 150 people as human beings because that was about the size of a big hunter-gatherer or, or troop would get, and everybody else is basically an abstraction. The other. The other. And the great thing about, I, I, you were very kind about saying I, I use terms that people can understand, but I'm going to violate that and use a little German social science on people. Um, there is this concept out of German social science, the Gemeinschaft versus the Gesellschaft. Gemeinschaft is community. Uh, the feeling of warmth from family, friends, local associations, the little platoons. Um, you know, the, if we all work our hardest and try our best, we can make this the best yearbook ever. That kind of feeling, right? And then there's Gesellschaft, which is the cold and personal market, the, the world of exchange, the world of contract, the world of the rule of law. The great thing about the 
the sell shaft, which is basically the law-driven marketplace, is it helps people deal with strangers. In a natural environment, for hundreds of thousands of years, if you had a bunch of apples and I wanted your apples, the way I would get your apples is I would hit you over the head with a rock and take your apples. The great thing about exchange, by, about market exchange, is it lets someone say, I like your apples. Do you like money? And they say, yes, I like money. And so I will give you some money for your apples. And so it is non-zero sum. It is win-win on both sides. And so the problem with the market, with capitalism, whatever term we want to use for it, it is, is in fact the most cooperative system ever conceived of for the, the, the peaceful mutual benefit of society. It's just got one problem. It doesn't feel like it. It is so good at being communitarian and cooperative that the cooperative part feels invisible. One of the greatest essays in the history of libertarianism is this essay by a guy named Leonard Reed called I, Pencil. And it's written from the perspective of the pencil. Like, I am an Eberhard and Faber number two pencil. And it goes on and explains how nobody knows how to make a pencil. Nobody knows how to make a pencil. Forget knows how to make an iPhone. No one knows how to make a pencil. And he points out that like my rubber comes from Indonesia, my tin comes from Argentina, my paint comes from Delaware, my wood comes from Canada. All these people worship different gods, speak different languages, have different political systems, work cooperatively and peacefully with one another without even meeting each other to produce something that costs less than a penny apiece. That is what the market can do. Command economies cannot do that. And so many of the forms of tribalism that get glorified by political scientists, I'm sorry, into very complicated, interesting terms, fascism, communism, authoritarianism, thisism, thatism, the otherism, they are basically glorified arguments for we want one group to be in charge, one group or one person to be in charge and tell us what to do and tell the economy how to work and boss us around. And that's very natural. That is the normal form of human organization. There's a reason why kings lasted so long in so many countries is because that is a scalable version of our normal tribal way of living in the evolutionary period. And I argue that almost all of these supposedly progressive, new, exciting ideas about how to reorganize society in different ways are in fact reactionary because they are different ways of saying we want to get out of this thing where the individual matters and the markets are good and all that kind of stuff, but we want to get back into a system that feels natural, that feels authentic. And this is a point, when I used to be allowed to talk to conservative students, this is the point I would hammer home to them all the time, which is that the most fundamental category error in politics, which conservatives sometimes make, progressives consider an article of faith, faith and only libertarians really understand, and I wish I could say that things had gotten better, but in fact, conservative, lots of conservatives are worse about this now than, than progressive are, is that the government cannot love you. It cannot fill your soul the hole in your soul. It cannot give you a sense of meaning. It cannot give you a sense of belonging. And all of those things in the subtitle, nationalism, populism, identity politics, these are, in, these are, are efforts to impose tribal concepts that give us meaning that we can get on the cheap from being a part of a group. Let's particularize that a little bit to the United States and into the experience of our own era to some degree. We have been comparatively uh, free in this country, or, or at least less plagued by isms uh, that, um, setting aside for a moment the term Americanism, mm -hmm. but but we have not had uh, we have not had the visitations. Let's put it that way of, of totalitarian isms that other countries in the world suffered under in the 20th century and still do in many cases. Uh, but we do have today, it seems, the rise of something that seems quite tribal in your terms, and that would be populism. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you turn to uh, in, your, in your book. And that then, of course, gets a new twist, a very different twist, from the rise of a particular personality. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you take that where, where you would. Sure. So I, it's funny. So I've been writing against populism for 20 plus years. Mm. And until the rise of Donald Trump, no one thought that this was a heretical position. And then all of a sudden, it became like, and I, I did say that the one exception for me is I was generally sympathetic to the Tea Parties at first. Because to me, it sort of felt like, oh my gosh, the, 
long prophesied libertarian populist movement has finally materialized and these people are going to storm Washington and leave everybody alone, right? And, that, and it didn't go that way, it got corrupted and hijacked by a lot of grifters and idiots, but um, uh, there were a lot of authentically decent people who were originally involved in all that and I think they got very badly mistreated by the media, which is one of the reasons why you got Trump, but that's another story. Um, populism basically just means peopleism. It is this idea that the that the the group is more important that the group's grievances trump everything else. No pun intended. And often, when I talk about the problem with populism, people say, "Well, what's wrong with populism? Isn't that democracy?" It's like, no, democracy is a system. It's a way of adjudicating and, and settling disagreements by different groups with a regularly scheduled election where people make arguments with each other. Populism isn't about arguments. Populism is inherently antithetical. My favorite quote about populism was from William Jennings Bryan, probably the most famous populist of the 19th century, who said, the people of Nebraska are for free silver, therefore I am for free silver. I will look up the arguments later. And um, I have so many friends on the right, like real friends, and uh, quite a few sort of, sort of friends who are now ex-friends, who would keep telling me that I didn't understand how great populism is over the last seven years. And um, one of the things they would always tell me is, you don't understand, people are really angry. Okay, I, I get that people are really angry. I, you should read my email sometime. It's like opening the Ark of the Covenant at the end of Indiana Jones. I mean, it's like... I get that people are angry, but let me ask you, when was the last time you made a really great decision when you were just really angry? I mean, like, searingly, blisteringly pissed off. Like, are, are you making, like, the best choices? And so much of populism, basically, it, populism is sort of a micro version of the worst parts of nationalism, and almost all nationalist movements are populist movements. Um, it is this idea that... Um, it's, they claim the language of being the people um, when in reality they are a subset of the people and they don't care about any arguments that are inconvenient to their will. And the, um, the founding fathers recognized that populism was a problem. They would talk about it in terms of passion and all that. But the whole idea was that the House of Representatives would absorb a lot of populist passion and then it would get cooled off and tempered in the Senate. And um, we now live in an age, partly because of social media and cable news and whatnot, where populism is just simply what people think politics is. It's like, like there are, I can't tell you how many young people are on Capitol Hill now running social media accounts for Republicans who think their job as a comms director is to just piss people off and own the libs, right? It's not about legislating. It's not coming up with good policy. It's not even making good arguments. It's just the institutionalization of being a dick. And, um, and that's what you get when you get runaway populism. It's like you get addicted to just being pissed off. And um, is, is Donald Trump somebody who bumped into the populist moment, into the sentiments that were welling up quite apart from him, and somewhat perhaps even a cork on a great tidal wave of history, that he was in the right place at the right time to be borne up by this? Yeah, I mean, we can get a little far afield from my actual book and more in the area of your expertise, if, if you like, because I have very strong feelings about this. I, I think, first of all, keep in mind, populism isn't purely right-wing. There are left-wing populisms. The Occupy Wall Street movement was quintessential populism. Bernie Sanders rode a populist wave in 2016 and almost captured the nomination of the Democratic Party. And um, I think that, you know, so there, there was a really influential um, study in the European Journal of Politics, I think that's the name of the journal, that found that since the 1820s, uh, financial crises, more than any other kind of eco economic dislocation, have very long populist tails. Mm. Uh, and so the 2007, 2008 financial crisis, uh, which caused people to lose their homes, created the Tea Party movement, created the Occupy Wall Street movement, I think Trump and Sanders both rode that wave considerably. Um, 
Now, the, the substance of their populist appeals are very different. I have huge problems with Bernie Sanders, but I don't think you know, he's not a nativist racist. Uh, and um, and he, although his, his views on immigration have evolved, interestingly. Um, but uh, I think that the, one of the reasons why we can't have nice things is that both parties are incredibly weak. Everyone loves to complain about excessive partisanship in this country. But what they don't realize is you get really crazy excessive partisanship when you have weak parties, not when you have strong parties. Strong parties protect their brands and keep crazy people from being the nominee of their party. Weak parties, as my friend Ross Douthat put it, are like fueled and prepped jet planes waiting on a tarmac to be hijacked. And Bernie almost, hi Bernie had no business running in Democratic primaries. Bernie Sanders has been an enemy of the Democratic Party for decades. He craps on them from the left. He caucused as an independent. He was very proud about this. He was an insurgent within the party. And the party was terrified of him. And they just said, come on in. Donald Trump had no business running as a Republican. Um, but everyone was just sort of terrified of him. Because one of the things that social media and cable news lets you do is it's like Mark Antony waving the bloody toga. You can whip up the mob to then put external pressure on office holders and, and, and fiduciary um, officers in ways that make them cave. And when you, when, you, when, you get, when you neuter the parties so they don't have any mechanisms to defend themselves, they basically become free-floating brands for whoever is popular. And so I think that's a big reason why Trump got the nomination and took advantage of it, and because to borrow a phrase from social science, he's an idiot. Um, um, and he was this disruptor, and he didn't know how the system worked and all that kind of stuff. And he didn't know anything about American history. I mean, he literally learned the phrase America first from a reporter who asked him, is your policy America first? And he's like, ah, I like the sound of that. I mean, like, literally, it's the transcript of the interview. Um, uh, he didn't know um, where silent majority came from, didn't know any, he stumbled on all these things tweeted like an escape monkey from a cocaine study. And, <laughs> and because he was so susceptible to flattery, like a lot of demagogues are, um, all you needed to do to buy prominence on the right was to be an absolute abject loyalist to him, because that was the only real standard. And criticism of him was de facto heresy. And that's why we've had the right get so screwed up in the last seven years. And that's all, of course, after the primaries that he won in 2016. That's right. Never getting a majority. Never getting a majority. I used to talk about him having 40% of 40% of the country, which only looked like 16% mathematically, but it was enough to leverage his right. way all the way to the White House and almost to a second term. So Trump is still with us. Uh, I don't want to get too carried away by that because I, I really do want to stay as close as possible to your book. But you do devote a chapter to the Trumpian era. I do. I do. And... Are we coming out of the Trumpian era? And if so, what comes next? Um, I, 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 one has to be very careful predicting Trump is going away. It's like waiting for Godot. You know, it's been a, there's been been a lot of predictions. A lot of people have been, been uh, made fools of by making, including me, um, ironclad predictions that he's going to go away and making the wish the father of the thought. Um, I do think it's probably more likely now, though that's a hard argument to make. I do think it's a very easy argument to make that it's more possible than it's ever been. Um, one of the great problems with the election uh, denial stuff from 2020 was that it prevented the GOP from having any internal conversations about how to learn lessons from losing. Normally what happens in a democracy is you lose it, your one side loses an election, and they say, man, we screwed up. What, do we, what can we do to do better next time? Well, if your claim is, is that the election was stolen and you didn't actually lose, you can't have that conversation, particularly if it's going to you know, piss off Cheeto Jesus. And so uh, they had to wait for the midterms in 2022. Um, and so now that long delayed conversation is coming really hard and really fast. It's completely caught Trump off guard. And of course, Trump helped things enormously by having dinner with a neo-Nazi, which is just great branding right after announcing that you're going to run again. So McCarthy and McConnell joined the chorus today. Yeah. And so now the leader of the Republican Party in the House, who 
may be the speaker. We talked about that a little bit. If there's interest, we, we can talk about it a little more. But, but the, the leader who would be the speaker and the known Republican leader in the Senate who's been reelected overwhelmingly uh, have added their voices to what had been a generally and rising chorus of disapproval and demands, really, that Trump denounce these people that he had supped with. Uh, that's perhaps just a side story, a sidebar, a footnote in history. On the other hand, perhaps it's an indicator. You're, you're suggesting that it might be an indicator that, and, and I, you're noticing again that your chapter is the Trumpian era. Mm -hmm. uh, we have clearly been through an interlude influenced by a personality, not the first time, but a, a personality who did seem wildly out of out of the stream of presidential origins, let's yeah. put it that way. Uh, and yet the era, in some sense or another, could spawn another. The feelings, the, the populism, the relationships, in terms of all of these ideas, uh, could spawn another. Do you feel the era is, in some sense or another, being retracted, or is it just the more or less inevitable downfall even Napoleon you know went to went went into banishment I mean is it just yeah. him so uh, it's not just him he's done indelible he's done serious and lasting damage to the right which breaks my heart you know I was at National Review for 20 years um, and um, he's done he has given it's an overused phrase but he's given a lot of very bad people the permission structure to be unapologetically worse people. And um, um, I don't think it's all on him. I think that we, you know, that the, we got Trump for complicated reasons. He made the problems in this country worse in the process. Um, and so I don't think it's, it's all going on. I, I get very conflicted about this because on the one hand, just talking about the doing the rank punditry of the McConnell and McCarthy stuff. On the one hand, because I spent 20 years fighting with and being attacked by the asinine anti-Semitic fringe of the fever swamp people, the National Review considered it part of its mission to hold back and to delegitimize. And, um, uh, and how I was left twisting in the wind in 2016, I think the, the ADL did a study, and I was, I think, the sixth uh, biggest recipient of anti-Semitic uh, attacks on social media in 2016. Um, and I would be telling people, you know, I was a conservative from good standing for a very long time. And I would be saying, you know, guys, it's not helpful when you talk about the alt-right as sort of part of the coalition when these people are talking about how, how many people named Goldberg can fit in an ashtray. And, um, uh, and I don't understand why you think I'm the one who's getting too worked up when I say I don't want to hang out with these people. <laughs> and, um, and so it became, so it's a little frustrating now to see people denouncing the, this Nick Fuentes guy who has sent people to harass me at speeches in the past and, um, I think is a, you know, I think he and Steve Bannon have hooves. I think they're evil people. But um, uh, on the other hand, as a matter of just simple politics, part of the secret I think that they've figured out is um, not giving Trump all of the attention that he wants. And um, and I find that some of the chasing down every single Republican dog catcher in the country and saying, "Do you denounce this?" I understand why cable news networks are addicted and why a lot of the liberal, liberal media outlets and, and pundits are addicted to this story. I'm not sure it's as beneficial to shrinking the tumor as some people think it is. There surely have been other moments that we expected to be that that uh, turned out not to be all the way back to the summer of 2015. Sure. Uh, so uh, I have other questions to ask you, and, and I'm sure other people in this room have many questions as well, so it's your turn. And I would like to turn this over to you. I know we've got a couple of people waiting with microphones, and we can get those to you. David, how did you want to uh, organize well, this? I'll, I'll, I'll take the prerogative of taking the first question. 
That's great. Thank you. So, uh, as you were talking, I, I was thinking about how you know a lot of people would classify religion as another one of the sources of tribalism, right? And then lots of examples, of course, where you can point to it, and maybe even especially Christianity or or at least certain um, versions of it. Uh, on the other hand, I'm, I know that you're very familiar with the, the classic argument by by Weber that, that claims that, that really like the engine of, of capitalism and all of that, all of its, some of its successes that you referred to uh, was really about, you know, the Calvinist uh, work ethic. And so I wonder if you have any thoughts on, on squaring those two things or just in general, uh, your feelings about the relationship between religion and, and capitalism. Sure. So, um, so when I was talking about the miracle, right? So one of the theories of where capitalism comes from is the Weberian thesis, which he kind of backtracked on later, uh, that uh, of the Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism, right? And this is this argument that, um, in a in a nutshell, um, the the early sort of hardcore Protestants um, of the sort of puritanical stripe. Uh, they embraced that this rhetorical change that I was talking about, right? And I, uh, when I say rhetorical, I don't mean inconsequential. I mean the way you act. It's, it's a psychological change um, that you should work hard, delay gratification. You know uh, that thrift is important, honest dealing is important, and the reason why this happened theologically was this argument that if you behaved as if you were a member of the select in terms of predestination and going to heaven, that maybe that was a sign that you actually were going to get to heaven, right? So it was like, fake it until you make it theologically. <laughs> and um, um, and I want to, so there are a couple points to make about that. The first is, is that whatever you think about that analysis or whatever you think about the theory, it's worth pointing out that none of these people believed it as a get-rich-quick scheme. This was, a, this was about the salvation of their souls. This was not about, you know, return on investment. And so the, um, where, and so I think there is some truth to the Protestant work ethic thesis, but at the same time, you know, I think a lot of Chinese people believed in hard work and thrift and, and saving and, and all these kinds of things. So like the idea that a bunch of guys on a Quaker cereal box invented this stuff, I think is a little overdone. Um, but more broadly, I think what you do get like, I got a lot of grief from sincere, smart people on my side of the aisle for not giving enough credit to religion in my argument. And I think some of the criticisms were very well taken. The key to me is um, Jesus' statement of render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God. And then when you have the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, um, you have the idea of religious authority and secular authority both sort of at odds with each other. And this is one of the key things is, that gets you to liberal democratic capitalism, is this idea that not all good things have to go together, that there can be friction between the city of God and the city of man. And um, it gets even broader after the, tre the, the Treaty of Westphalia. I know all you guys are going to be talking about the Treaty of Westphalia later. But basically what that did is it put the end to the wars of religion. And it was not, and what they basically said, very bad summary, bumper sticker, is that we're no longer going to settle religious disagreements at the point of a sword. And the only reason they agreed to do that was because for 100 years they'd been trying to, and it sucked. right? And so a lot of liberalism comes out of trying to just create the safe distance between religion and secular authority and it's in those spaces that strangers who disagree on divine things can get along. And so I think that the worst forms of religion as a political matter, I'm not talking about the actual theology, are the ones that try to create a kingdom of heaven on earth, that think that you can actually restore righteous relations in every regard, theocracies that think that all good things go together and there's a unity of goodness. The great thing about Christianity and Judaism is that it says, and, and, and many forms of Islam, and I, I'm not an expert on these things, is that it says the perfect world is the next life, not this one. And you should behave in a way that increases your chances of getting there. I mean, I know it's complicated for Jews, but. Um, and you know, one of my philosophical heroes, William uh, Vogelin, 
you know, talked about this thing which William F. Buckley made into a bumper sticker for his mayoral race, which is don't eminentize the eschaton, which is this idea of taking what is reserved for the perfect world of the hereafter and trying to impose it on the here and now, which is what communists try to do, it's what fascists try to do, it's what, uh, whether they're secular, or it's what the ayatollahs have tried to do, and that is a source for tyranny and oppression that takes you away from the sort of freedom and prosperity of America. All right. I know we, I saw some hands earlier. Yes, sir. Um, I came in. <clears throat> I came in a little bit late, but mm. but you were talking about when I when I walked in. You were talking about how some people are. One set of society is like what you your friends. You treat your friends differently mm -hmm. than you treat someone else. You had a very good example that you that you used. That it's you have much more trouble saying no to someone that you know than you do right. some strange guy who's just giving you money. And but don't you think that I mean I grew up in Europe, and even in Germany, and I grew up in Na Naples, Italy, which is almost in Africa. <laughs> and I mean, seriously. Yeah. And and so it's very much Middle Eastern kind of a of a of a um, relationship with people, but it just seems that the democratic um, social or not socialism, but democratic uh, liberalism, only really is developed here in the United States, and where we have a large um, setup, we've got a very good. Um, infrastructure for industry. But everywhere else, even in Europe, it's an extension always of the United States. But and that the normal it seems to me that the the normal way that people would react is what you what you say is not good and it keeps people down. Um like right for me I always go to the same restaurant and then I get to know the owner and Whenever I go there, oh, you're not waiting. You're waiting for a table. Sit down. You know, don't worry about it. Uh, or would you like to have a, a whole platter of um, of um, of lamb chops? I'll get I'll get you one. You know, we'll, we'll make it special. It's not on the menu, but mm -hmm. you, I I I know what you want. And I just think that 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 is much more of a universal approach than what you look at in terms of a rules sure. uh, operation. Yeah, so look, I, 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 if, I, if I get the question, um, let me put it this way. I think both are hugely important. Um, I, I, I've been saying this for years now. My daughter's in college now, but like, um, I'm a communist in my house. I don't charge my daughter rent. I don't charge her for food, right? Um, if you have two kids, um, you don't like, feed the one that does well at school different food than the one who does poorly at school, right? It really is from each according to their ability to each according to their need. It's like you love them all the same. You, um, if, if, my, if, if, if my uncle or my cousin or my, uh, my late brother or a good friend of mine comes to my house in the middle of the night at 3 in the morning and says, can I sleep on your couch? I'm going to say, absolutely. You know, I don't care what happened, right? If a total stranger does, it's different. Right, and so the whole point of uh, of these two things is you need both. You need for a healthy society, you need this 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 zone of friends, family, faith, community, all of that. But you still need a system for dealing with the larger world outside of that. And the two have to li live in a kind of tension, but also they reinforce each other. And so like. For example, if you tried, I, I don't want to keep going back to the cell shaft and the minor shaft, but if you tried to take the one system and impose it on the other, you'll ruin both. This is why I hate it when people talk about the President of the United States being the country's father. I mean, George Washington is a little different because it's a metaphor about the starting of the country, but you'll find this all the time. Trump supporters said it about Trump. Obama supporters said it about Obama. The President of the United States is the head of one branch of one, one third of one branch of the federal government. And he's not my father. Um, and he doesn't know me. He 
can't know me. Um, the government can write checks for me, and they can import, it, it impose laws, but it can't love me. And similarly, if you try to cheat, treat your family or your friends as if they're just customers or just you know, people under contract, you'll ruin the concept of the family. And so these two that you need, one of, the, one of the things I dislike the most about Obama's political philosophy was in 2012, in his second inaugural, he talks about how there's the federal government and there's the individual, and nothing in between. Um, and uh, he says, you know, the government is there. You know, this was a big popular phrase in the Obama years. Hillary Clinton said it, Barney Frank said it, Barack Obama said it. There's this idea you hear all the time that government is just another word for the things that we do together. No, it's not. Government is the word for government. The things we do together are things like softball leagues and baseball leagues and, and, and soccer clubs and, and bowling leagues and church and synagogue and yearbook committee and all of these things that don't look to the government for approval, that give us a sense of meaning and enjoyment in life. And um, you know, there are only about five things in the world that make people happy. It's faith, family, friends, experiences, uh, this thing called, uh, uh, in genetics, because some people are just born miserable bastards, and, um, and this thing called earned success. And earned success is this sense that says, I des you can be poor, you can be a stay-at-home mom, you can be a janitor, it has nothing to, I mean, you can get a sense of earned success from being successful in financial stuff, but there are a lot of miserable people who are rich. Earned success is this idea that I'm valued for my contribution, that there's something about me that people are going to miss if I'm gone, that I've changed people's lives, that I'm loved. And you can't get that from government. You get that from these other things. And so you need both for a healthy society. And if you mistake that you can get one, you're, you're, you can't have civil society imposing financial regulation. And you can't have the federal government trying to fill up the hole in your soul. The government is really good about improving your net worth, but not your self-worth. Self-worth comes from the people who love you and know you by name. And that's what you get from this Gemeinschaft. We have someone right straight in the back here, in center field. And I promise to stop filibustering. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Jackie, and I'm a freshman here, so kind of new to all these ideas, but I just wanted to thank you for your um, dialogue. Um, so my question is, you talked about um, how liberal democracy, like liberal democratic capitalism lifted people up and placed the focus on the individual but one of the reasons that populism is rising is because people feel unheard and um, misunderstood. So does that mean we need a new like era of rhetoric, or do we need do we need to change the conversation about ourselves to like um, match the reality of like our mm -hmm. um, our like current system of government, or do we need to change the current system of government to like change the the way people feel? Yeah, look, it's a complicated thing. It's a good question. I don't have like perfect answer to my own satisfaction, never mind one that will be to your satisfaction. But part of my answer is that too much power has been centralized in the United States, in the federal government, and if you want to say in corporate America, slightly different conversation, but that's fine, whatever. But my view is that we should, that, that whole thing about seeing people as an abstraction, right? If you push power down to the most local level possible, You'll still have culture war fights, right? But the winners are going to have to look the losers in the eye at their kids' soccer games or at the supermarket or at drop-off at school or whatever. And so you're going to see the people you disagree with as human beings rather than abstractions who live a 1,000 miles away. Um, part of the problem we have in, this society, in our politics is that we basically take turns electing two different coalitions of people who want to tell everybody else how to live. And if you push decisions down to the most local level possible, look, you have, to, you have to protect, you can't have Jim Crow, you have to protect the Bill of Rights and all that kind of stuff. But the idea that somehow, you know, that the FDA should be telling people in Oregon, you know, what kind of cheese they can buy, sort of kind of crazy to me, right? That kind of thing. 
um, and let people decide how they want to live where they live. And the good part about, one of the good things about that is one, it imposes a certain amount of humility because you're going to know the people that you're trying to impose your views on. But two, if government officials screw up, you know their names. You know who to fire, right? It's not like those unseen forces in Washington. It's Bob and Phil and Ted and Alice. And like they screwed up, so fire them. And so people will feel like they have a little bit more of control over the rules that actually affect their lives. Um, one of my favorite episodes of The Simpsons, which came out before most of you were born, was when Bob Dole and Bill Clinton were running for president in 1996, and two aliens, Kang and Kodos, came down and took their bodies and took their forms, right? And there's this great scene where uh, it's, it's Bob Dole or Kang, right, um, who goes out on the steps of the Capitol and says, abortions for everyone. And the crowd goes, boo. And he says, he processes this. And he's like, abortions for no one. And the crowd goes, boo. Abortions for some, little tiny American flags for others. And the crowd goes, yay. Right? Um, it got at something real, which is like, don't impose your one-size-fits-all way of how people should live on a country of 330-something million people. Um, policy is supposed to bubble up from below in this country, not be imposed from above. And give more people buy-in, a sense of participation. Um, uh, that's the best way, I think, to solve some of these problems. The other thing is, stop watching cable news. Look, I, I make a living from cable news and all that kind of stuff. Stop watching it, right? Certainly stop watching the opinion shows. I mean, when I'm on, turn it on, fine. But, um, um, and, and, and don't get your politics from social media too much. Um, because the incentive structures on both of these things is to piss people off, make people angry, um, and being constantly angry is just no way to live your life. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Erica, I'm also a freshman, and I have a question about what you were talking about with, uh, I guess, community building and forming communities. I guess a lot of those ideas are kind of similar to what, what uh, Robert Putman also talked about in his book, Bowling Alone, mm -hmm. and how a decrease or removal of different areas where people in a community can come together leads to societal like distrust. Mm -hmm. And so I guess in our recent times of increased uh, polarization between our different tribes and the different cultural identities, how are we going to rebuild that societal trust from the bottom up? It's going to be hard. It's a great question. I wish I had a great answer for you. Uh, this is, you're, if you haven't heard about it already, this is going to be the next big sort of panicky thing is this idea of the loneliness crisis in America. And the data is really bad. People are just withdrawing from just normal friendships. The share of people who say they have friendships that they see in real life has plummeted. COVID made it all worse. Social media ma makes it worse. And uh, this is something at the American Enterprise Institute where I hang my hat. We spend a lot of time thinking about um, because you know the role of institutions isn't just to give people. It's not. It's not just happy hour, right? It's like let's have people show up and have conversations and feel like they're part of something. The institutions need to solve something. Need to do something. And I think it's going to be incumbent upon a lot of people of your generation to come up with new institutions that solve actual problems, that create incentives for people to participate in them. And um, you know, I think about the technology is a real challenge in this stuff, because the things that your phone can do, you used to need other people to do. Um, and uh, I'll give you a sense of how old I am. I, at my college, uh, I, when I became the editor of the school newspaper, we used to, when I got there, use exacto knives to cut out long strips of paper and put them and lay out, literally that's where layout comes from, is lay out the newspaper by with glue sticks and pieces of paper and, and that kind of thing. And I was like, oh, this is backward. We should switch to like new design software, blah, blah, blah. You know, I got a, a new Apple and all that kind of stuff. It was great for the look of the newspaper. It was terrible for the institution. Because what, happened, what used to be was that everybody who was on the staff was required to show up once a week for layout night, you get to 
pizza and they all show up and you talk and you have conversations and you gossip and you have fun, whatever, and you felt like you were needed and you belong. The second we moved to this new technology for how to lay out a newspaper, you had one guy sitting at the keyboard, right, and me looking over his shoulder, and everyone else just dropped off a disk or a USB drive, as you crazy kids would call it, um, and, and leave. And people just didn't feel part of a culture, part of a thing. So much of technology lets people live alone in ways that um, they used to need other people to sort of help out, to be part of. And so figuring out new forms of, of association, new forms of institutions that let people feel like they're part of something for constructive purposes, I think is, is, is super important. But the, the, the social science data on this is settled. Like, I have a, a friend of mine who wrote a wonderful book on this very topic, uh, uh, Tim Carney, wrote a book called Alienation, where he was so bowled over by you know, Putnam and other data on this that he was like, I'm going to start a t-ball league, just so like parents would feel like they're part of something, that they would show up. And he, he followed a law of nature established on college campuses many decades ago. Get a keg, and they will come. <laughs> and um, um, and so figuring out so that kind of stuff, I think, is hugely important. And um, I, I hope people are up to it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you, John. So. Um, just really quickly, uh, let me just say, you know, to, to stay on the lookout for information about our next Thurber Dialogue on Democracy, which will take place in January with Bob Bauer, who was, of course, President Obama's general counsel and co-chaired the President's Commission on Election Administration. He's currently uh, chairing President Biden's Commission on Reforms to the Supreme Court and the judiciary more generally. So that'll be another great conversation. And, and thanks for showing up and stick around for some refreshments. Hi, everybody. Uh, if you guys want to head out through the back door that you guys came in through, uh, we have our reception outside. <laughs>